What's good, my statisticians? This is Professor Simpson from PSI Love Math. I just ran in to give you another statistical banger. Last class, we talked about measures of center and measure of dispersion. This class, we'll be talking about measure of position. So sit down, relax, grab yourself a matcha, and don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. <laughs> glad you took a run with me. So today you're going to be taking matches. You're going to be taking a whole bunch of stuff with me because we got some stuff to cover, but let's get into it. So we're going to be covering today's section 3.3, which is measures of relative position. So what does that mean? So remember, we talked about the mean, all right? We talked about the measures of center. We talked about where it is related to the center of the data. We talked about measures of dispersion, variation, how the data varies. Um, and now we want to talk about position. Why is position important? Well, it's where something's located in relationship to some other thing. So where are these numbers located based on some other numbers? For example, standardized testing all right, so is a percentile. That is which that is relative position, percentiles, all right? So when you're taking a standardized test and they say that you have this and you're in the 74th percentile, that means you did better than or equal to 74% of the people. You did uh, worse than, if you want to say that, 26% of the people. But you know, most people are glass half full and not half empty. So you did better than 74% of the people. But we want to know where you are in relationship to something else, to some other point. That's why relative position comes in. We know the center, we know the, the variation, how does it vary? But what about this position? Well, let's talk about that since we mentioned percentile. So percentile. Percentile is out of 100. So basically, you break your number line into what? 100. And you can break your number line into anything. Percentiles is out of 100, so we base it out of 100. Okay, so when we're talking about that, we're talking about approximately what percentage of the data lies at or below a given value. So we're talking about approximately what percentage of the data lies at or below a given value. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about standardized test. So I think an example is if you an ACT score of 24, then you are in that what I said, you would be in the 74th percentile, which means what? That 70, you did better than or equal to 74% of the people taking the test. That means that score is better than or equal to 74% of the people taking the test. So in math, we want to we want to get these numbers. We want to figure out how to get these numbers. So sometimes we want to locate a data value for the percentage we're getting, or sometimes we want to locate the data value. What does that mean? This is the data value, right? Right, And this is the percent. So what I'm saying is that sometimes you'll be given the data value and ask for the percent, or sometimes you'll be given the percent and ask for the data value. So this is the one way. So in this one, the first thing we're going to talk about is location of a data value for the peak percentile. That means that this time you're given the percentile so you're given the 74th percentile, for example, and then they're asking you what data value relates to that percentile. So there's a formula. Now these formulas are really out there. What I mean by out there is that there are several ways to calculate this, depending on people, depending on textbooks, depending on whatever. So we have to find a way in this particular text that I'm working with to do it. Now, if you're in my class, this is the way you do it. If you're in other classes, there may be other ways. So if you're in another class, then comment down, down below and then I can go over a different way. But this is how you do it. L is equal to N times P over 100. L is the location of the peak percent percentile, the location. N we already know is what? N is the number of data values in the sample and P is the peak percentile. And all of these data that we're going to talk about is, is going to be a ordered array. I didn't use the exact word. What I said in layman's term was that you put the values in order. All right. So you're always going to be putting these values in order, not just having them. That's why we learned how to do it on a calculator. So let's say you're given, you're given the percentile and then they're asking you, okay, what is the data value? So that's what they mean. They're asking you to locate the data value. So what are the steps to locating this data value? Step one, list the data values in order. Step two, if a decimal value for L, that's L, the L up at top that I put in cursive. Step two, if you get a decimal value for L after you use the above formula, then the location is going to be the next whole number. Step three, if you get a whole number for L, then average that data value with the next larger location. Okay, the issue is 
that L is a location. It's where the number is. It is not the number. It is where the number is. L stands for location. It is not the number. So L is the location. I'm going to say it again. It is not the number. So this is telling you about location. That's why you have to list the data values in order. We'll do an example. These are the steps to make sure you got down the steps. So these are the steps if you're given the percentile and they're asking you for the data value. So in this case, if you're given 74th percentile and they're asking you what number, what data value, what ACT score relates to the 74th percentile. The other way it could be done, so in this case, they're giving you the data value and they're asking you what percentile, the 5th, the 6th, the 18th, the 74th, what percentile. Now you're going to use this formula. Now students are, are either you have to be one way or another, L over N times one. Okay, so students go, oh, I need to remember memorize all these formulas. These two formulas are the same. They're just algebraically manipulated. Or you could put, just, just put the numbers in the same formula and learn how to algebraically manipulate it. So these are the same formulas. So technically you don't have to memorize an additional formula if you know some algebra. I'll show you what I mean in the sidebar in a second. But here's the formula if you're looking for the pth percentile, like what percentile? 74th percentile? So in this case, L is the number of values less than or equal to the given value. So in this case, if the ACT is 24, L would be the number of data values less than or equal to 24. And as usual, N is the number of data values in the sample. That never changes. So for this number, since you're getting a percentile, you won't ever have a decimal. You just need to round to the nearest whole number. So regular rounding rules apply for this. So you won't get a 17.8 percentile or anything like that. So regular rounding rules, that means that if you had a P, was equal to 36.2, 30, the 36th uh, percentile, right? Because that's the two. If this was 36.8, and that would be equal to the 37th percentile, just so you know. So regular rounding rules apply for this. All right, time for the matrix again. Okay, so let's get started with some examples. So here's our first of many examples. And if you came here for a short video, that's not what you're about to get. Move on to the next one. That shows you how to do it in five minutes. We are going to walk through all of this. It, this is important that we walk through all of it. And so stop, take a picture, okay? So you can put in these exact same numbers that I'm going to put into my calculator. Walk, walk slowly and talk. Talk slowly, you are. So the first thing we want to do while we're already in here is sort them. So and then I always go in to double check and make sure it's sorted. The first question says, which weight represents the 50th percentile? So again, they're giving us the 50th percentile and they want to know which one of these numbers in here for these Yorkshire Terriers, they want to know which one of these numbers in here represents the 50th percentile. So here they're giving you the percentile. So we're going to use the first formula, L equals N times P over 100. And L is the what? It's going to be the location of this particular weight. That's what L is. So let's put everything in here. So you're going to get L equals N. How many terriers were there? 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. And you could have looked in your data to see that. So 15 times now we have our percentage, which is 50. 50 out of 100 is the 50th percentile. And you're going to pop that in your handy dandy notebook and see what we get here. So 15 times 50 over 100, okay? And you get 7.5. Now don't write down 7.5 as your answer. This is the problem. Okay, 7.5. Some students will write 7.5 because they see 7.5 up here and they're saying the 7.5. This is not a number. This is not a data value. This is a location to where the data value will be. So that's when you got to look at, check out your two rules, right? Your first rule is if you get a decimal value for L, did we get a decimal value for L? Yes. Okay. The location is the next larger whole number. So we got a decimal value for L, all right, which is 7.5. The next larger whole number for 7.5 is 8. It would not matter if it was 7.1. All right, these are not rounding rules. You're just going to the next whole number, okay? Not rounding rules. If it was 7.1 or 7.2 or 7.3, we would still go to 8 because we're looking for the 8th location, all right? This is when your calculator comes in. So we're going to go to the 8th location. That's not 7.5. The answer is not 7.5. We're going to go to the eighth location. 
So let's go back to our calculator, go back to our data. And then as you see their numbers, so when you see the eighth location, you see L18, that's the eighth location. So your answer is 7.4. So your answer to this problem is 7.4 pounds is how much the weight of the terrier would be in the 50th percentile. So you see with the location, you're looking for the location in, in the list. If it's any type of decimal, you go up to the next whole number and then you count. You don't physically have to count since you numbered them in the calculator. B, what is the percentile of a weight of 8.2 pounds? So now they're giving you the weight and asking you for the percentile is equal to L over N times 100. So the percent, that's what we're looking for, is equal to L. This 8.2 is not L. In this case, L is the number of values less than or equal to the given value. That's why it's important that you have your values in order. So we're looking for less than or equal to 8.2 pounds. All we have to do is go back to our calculator, find out what position 8.2 is in. You see that's 11, right? Position 11. So anything 11 or less will be less than or equal to 8.2. If there was another 8.2, you would go down to that 8.2. So it's less than or equal to even if it's double. But this is 8.2, so it's position 11. So that's what you're going to do. You're going to have 11. You see, it's not that 8.2 because it's the low. All of these L's have to do with locations of the value. It's location number 11, not 8.2 pounds. 11 over 15, that's N times 100. 100 changes it to a percent. So this is 73.3. All right, 73.333, whatever, but 73.3. Your answer is going to be a percentage and a percentage is a whole number. So what percentile is this? This is going to be the 73rd percentile. Now we can have a quick recap and then do the other one. So you can memorize these formulas or again, you can use the same one formula. So for example, this is an extension. Let's say I just wanted to remember the one formula. L is equal to N times P over 100. Remember L is always some kind of location, the location. So the location is going to be 8.2. You're gonna look it up. You're still going to get 11. So 11 is equal to N 15 times P over 100. Again, if you remember your algebra, 11 is equal to 15 P over 100. Remember we used to cross multiply. So 11 times 100 is 1100 is equal to 15 P. Then we would divide both sides by 15, divide by 15. So 1100 divided by 15 is equal to 73.33. So your percentage again is 73.3, which is a 73rd percentile. Okay. So I usually use one formula, but you can memorize both of them. It doesn't matter as long as you know, L is talking about a location and L will never be a number that you get out of your problem. Again, more data to take a picture of. Okay. I'm going to put these in my calculator and you can take a picture of the data so you can put it in your calculator too. This time I'm gonna put mine in L2. You can delete and put yours in L1, but I'm just gonna put mine in L2 because I feel like, oh my God. Just remember you have to be careful and make sure your data's in exactly right. There's no way to correct when the data's in wrong. So I'm gonna go in and order my data. I do that right away. I don't wait for anything. I know that whenever I use any of this, I'm gonna need my data ordered. So I'm not gonna wait. Now I just happen to put my data in L2 this time. So I'm gonna hit second and then the number two which is going to order my data in L2, that's all. And you can take a look at my data in L2, it's in order. The following data represents numbers of tweets per day posted on Twitter for 16 high school students. Which number represents the 25th percentile? And you're looking for the number, L equals N times P over 100. And we're going to plug in our numbers. L, your location is going to be N. Uh, N is the number of data points, so they said there were 16 high school students. The percentage they gave you was 25 over 100. Let's pop that in a handy dandy notebook, 16 times 25 over 100. I right, make sure you put any fractions in parentheses. Oh, this time we get four, so we get a whole number. So this time we get location four. This is a different rule. I try to think of it like this. Students say, well, how do I remember? What do I do? You're going to do something to either one of them. If you noticed in our first problem, when we got 7.5, we had to turn it to eight and then find the eighth location. So we didn't go from this number 7.5 right into the table. Same thing with this number. When 
when we get a whole number, we don't just go to the fourth location. This is never going to give you the exact location. You're going to have to do something. That's how you're going to remember. Students ask all the time, how do I remember what to do? Because you're always going to have to do something. You're not going to use this location and say this is the fourth location. So it says if you get a whole number, if you get a whole number for L, which we did, then average that data value with the next larger location. So we're going to average location four and location five per the directions. Are we going to average the numbers four and five? No, we're going to average the numbers in location four and five. Let's go to our stat and go back to our edit. And then I'm in number two. So location four is 3.7. Location five is 9.4. 3.7 and 9.4. So we're going to average 3.7 and 9.4. How do we average something? We add them together and divide by the number of data values. So pop that in your calculator. That's going to give you 6.55. This is your answer. 6.55. When you're done that, that's your answer. So location 25, the 25th percentile is 6.55 tweet. When you get a decimal, you have to take it up to the next whole number. Then you just count to that particular location. If you get a whole number, don't try to use that whole number. You need to take that whole number location with the next whole number location, average those, and then you'll get your actual answer. He says, what is the percentage of an average of 11.5 tweets? T is equal to L over N times 100. As long as you remember that what L is not a what? L is not this 11.5. L is a location. We look for 11.5 and we find the location of 11.5. So that's going to be number seven. It's going to be less than or equal to seven. So that's going to be data location seven over 16 times 100. So I got 43.75, 43.75. Um, we're looking for a percentile. So a percentile is a whole number. Since this is a seven, remember our rules tell us to bring that up. It's a 44. So the number 11.5 is in the 44th percentile. And those are our two examples for that. You can rewind or actually, why don't you comment down below because this was a lot of example here. Let's move on. I'm tired. I need a matcha because I'm tired of talking and we still aren't even halfway through this video. So why don't you go grab you some chips and you know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get me a matcha. Just give it up. I'm not your girl and I never will be. Don't call me up. Don't waste your time. Cause I'll be your enemy If you want love Look somewhere else Heal for nothing Just give it up I'm not your girl Cause I only love me Don't get me wrong You and I could have fun together When I feel done With having fun on my own It's better to care for yourself Thanks for helping me make my matcha. Don't forget to subscribe. I hope you like the matcha. Next thing, I labeled the first part part A. So if you go back up to your notes next to percentile, you can put part A. And for B, I put quartile. So we're going to do quartile now. We said that we can break up these this number line into any types of numbers that we want. The first time we broke it up in hundred, this time we're going to break it up into four parts called quartiles. So let's talk about these quartiles. Quartile one is like quarters. That's going to be the first quarter, and that's going to be twenty five percent. So we're saying that twenty five percent of the data less than or equal to whatever the value is. Quartile two is going to be the second quartile, which means 50% of the data is less than or equal to that value. And quartile three is going to be the third quartile, which means 75% of the data is less than or equal to that data. 25, 50%, 75. So the next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to find the five number summary. And what is the five number summary? The five number summary is made up with the quartiles and the max and minimum value. So what's the five number summary made of? It's made up of the minimum, Q1, Q2, Q3, and the max. And Q2 is the median, just so you remember that. Q2 is the median. So this is the five number summary. As a side note, the five Five number summary goes with something that we call a box and whisker plot. We will not be covering box and whisker, <laughs> box and whisker 
plot in my class. But if you're somewhere else and you would like me to do a video on that, comment down below and I will show you how to do a box and whisker plot. So we're not going to be doing such a, a plot, but it just requires you to put this min Q1, Q2, Q3, and max on a number line. That's what a box and whisker plot does. But we will be finding a five number summary. So let's do a quick example. Here's some data and it's pretty simple in your calculator. So don't forget, take a picture of this data so that we can get it into your calculator. So take a real a picture of this or write it down or whatever, pause the video. I'm going to go into my calculator and put this data. Find the fine number summary. You're just going to go to stat. You're going to go to calc. Stat, calc, and back to that one variable statistics, right? And there it is. If you scroll down, you see here, min Q1, Q2, which is the medium, 8.4. Q3 is 9.2. And the max is 10.1. That's all you need to write for the five number summary. So the answer to this problem of the five number summary would simply be, and you list them in order, do not try to change the order. 5.4, 7.15, I think it was 8.4, 9.2, and 10.1. That's it for the five number summaries. You list your, this is the min, 5.4 is the min. You have Q1, 7.15, Q2, which is the medium, 8.4, Q3, which is the max. Uh, Q3, which is 9.2, and then 10.1 is the max. That's what you have in your calculator. Just copy that down. We want to get the interquartile range. And if you remember what the range was, if you recall, the range was, it was the highest data value minus the lowest data value, okay? So back to what we're talking about, all right? We're going to talk about the interquartile range as we call, we call it IQR. So the interquartile range is a range, right? Is the range of the middle 50% of the data. What does that mean? But the IQR is going to be Q3 minus Q1. That's what the interquartile range is or IQR. So why do we need this IQR? Well, the IQR tells us the what it says, the range of it. But we use the interquartile range to find out outliers. So earlier today in one of my classes, I was talking about ages. And I said, well, most of the students here are probably between 17. And I put out 25. It might be older students. But let's say if it was 17 or 25 or whatever. If most of my students were between 17 and 25, and I throw my old self up in there at 50, that would throw things off. And we would say, hey, that number is just way out outside of what we're talking about. Just like if, if my ages were 17 to 25 and I said the age of five, that number is way outside of what we're talking about. But we can't say, hey, that's way outside. Why? Because I said so. Like your mother used to say? No, you can't say that of identifying outliers. So we're going to use the IQR to identify outliers. So that's one of the uses of the IQR, to use that to identify outliers. Here are the steps in identifying outliers. The first step is to find the IQR. Step two is to subtract the IQR times 1.5 from Q1. Q1 minus the IQR. QR times 1.5. Step three is to add the IQR times 1.5 to Q3. And then anything outside of the these lower and upper limits will be outliers. Now you can have no outliers. You can have outliers on one side. You can have outliers on both sides. It just depends. When you get these numbers, it'll tell you if you're going to have an outlier. So here's our example. So we're going to calculate the IQR and then we're going to use the IQR to see if we have any any outliers. So part A is going to be to calculate the IQR. So the IQR is what? Is equal to Q3 minus Q1, right? So that means we have to do what? Put our data in the calculator and do one variable statistics. I'll put this in my calculator. You take a picture of the data so you can follow along with me. Ooh, as you see, we got in all our data. So once we got in all our data, we're going to go right back here. We're going to go to that and calculate, go over to one variable statistics and L one and you see if you scroll down we'll see our q3 and our q1 so it's 15.4 minus 12.9 15.4 minus 12.9 so our interquartile range which gave us 2.5 b is use the iqr to identify any outlier so to find the lower limit of the outlier we said we have to take q1 which we said was 12.9 and subtract the interquartile range 2.5 times 1 
1.5. Remember that? Interquartile range is 2.5 times 1.5. That's going to give us our lower limit. 12.9 minus 2.5 times 1.5. So then we should get 9.15. So our lower limit is going to be 9.15. For our upper limit, we're going to get our Q3, which we said is 15.4. And we're going to add 2.5 times 1.5. So 15.4, 2.5 times 1.5. 19.15. Okay, so all that means is that any numbers lower than this or greater than this are going to be outliers. That's all that means. So do we have any numbers lower than this? So instead of trying to look through your numbers again, this is a time where you go back to your calculator and here I want to put them in order. And so I'm looking for any number less than 9.15 or greater than 19.15. So let's see. Well, 9 is definitely less than 9.15. And then I can scroll to the bottom and see if I have anything greater than 19.15, which I don't. So I only happen to have one outline. So the answer to the question is 9.0. And here we go. But wait, there's more. Whew. I'm tired. So the last thing in this chapter we're going to talk about is standard score. And this last thing would be if you had anything in here, this is the most important topic in this whole three chapter. Why? Because we'll be using this standard score for the rest of the class. Damn. It's called the standard score. What it's actually called is a Z-score. We will change the name later, so I want you to get used to it. A Z-score or standard is just a standardized score. It tells us how far a value is from its, from its mean, specifically how many standard deviation it is away from the mean. So remember before, if we recall the empirical rule, it tells us that one standard deviation is 68%, two standard deviations is 95, and three standard deviations is 99.7. That's the empirical rule. It just tells us that the standard score tells us how many standard deviations a particular data value is from the mean. So we would say a particular data value is. So how far that data value is. How far is eight from the number of knots? How far is that data value away from the mean? That's what the Z score is. Is. That's what the standardized score is. Whatever you want to call it, it's usually called the Z-score. A standard score or a Z-score, also known as a Z-score, tells us how far a value lies from the mean, specifically how many standard deviations it is away from the mean. How many standard deviations is this particular point away from the mean? That's what it means. It's not a percentage how many, you remember I was talking about those humps, how far it is away from the mean. And here are our uh, formulas for it. Now you do have to memorize these formulas. Formulas, but the formula is pretty easy. The standard score, I'm going to just start calling it a z-score, is x minus mu for the population. Remember, population has population values. Remember, this is the population mean, and this is what the population standard deviation. So the population, the z-score for a population has population letters, and the z-score for a sample has sample letters. So it's x minus x bar all over f, right, where x bar is is the sample mean, right? And S is the sample standard deviation. So those are the formulas. You have to memorize it. You just need to memorize that Z is X minus some kind of mean over the standard deviation. Now it's pretty simple if I give you a couple numbers. Let's say I said that mu, mu was equal to 25, sigma was equal to 3, and X was equal to 27, which is 27 minus mu, which is 25, all over the standard deviation, which is 3. I'm going to put this in capital letters, round rules for Z is two decimal places. No more, no less. Two decimal places. Two decimal places. Write that down. If it's a whole number, you must put the decimal place. So your answer is 0.666666 is going on forever. But you need two decimal places. You can put the zero in front of it. But your Z score or your standard score is going to be 0 0.67, right? Because it was 0 0.66666 kept going on. Two decimal places. Round it properly, right? Two decimal places, regardless of what kind of answer you get. 0.32, sigma is equal to 0 0.01, and x is equal to 0.29, is equal to x 0.29 minus mu all over 0 0.01. Your answer is negative 3 from the calculator. If you write that this is wrong, uh, why? 
why? Because it is not two decimal places. Point zero, zero. Must have zero. Standard score is always two decimal places. How many times can I write that? Did I write it enough? The standard score or the Z score is always two decimal places. Okay, here's our first of two examples here. Now, of course, if I give you Z equals mu equals X bar equals, you can get it. But that's not what statistics is about. Statistics is about word problems and making comparisons. So this is going to be one where you make a comparison. So Carlita scored 32 on the ACT mathematics test. That's her actual score. So for her, that's X. So Carlita scored X equals 32. That was on her ACT test, on the ACT math test. And then she, and a 730 on the mathematics section of the SAT. So she scored a 730 on that same section on the SAT, both math. Go figure, right? If the ACT mathematics test has a mean of 2.0. Now, are we talking about a population or are we talking about a, well, it's the act mathematic test, the whole thing, every, not somebody. So this is going to be the population. So the act mathematic test, the act mathematic test gave her a population mean mu of 21.0 and a standard deviation is still the standard deviation of that whole test. So we're going with sigma equals 5.3 for the act. And the mathematics section of the of the SAT gave a mean score of 516 and a standard deviation of 160. These are the types of problems you will get, not that other one that I gave you, right? On which exam did Carlita earn a better math score re with respect to her peer, all right? Of course, you're trying to figure this out, but with respect to her peers. So let's do the Z score for the act. So that's going to be X minus mu all over the standard deviation, right? It's 32 minus mu, 21.0 over the standard deviation, which is 5.3. 2.08. Make sure you got that. So she is 2.08 standard deviations away from the mean with the act score. Once we get those numbers in, 730 minus 516 divided by 116, she get what? The Z score for her SAT. 1.8. Which exam did Carlita earn a better math score with respect to her peers? Well, on the ask, on the SAT, she was 1.84 standard deviations above her peer. On the act, she was 2.08 standard deviations above her peer. So which one? She did better. She did better in math with respect to her peers. Everybody cool with that? So that's how we work those problems. Down for one more, you might as well be, you stayed this long. Another example, Don played in a local golf tournament for charity and scored a round of 63. All right, so Don played in a local golf tournament and he scored a round of 63. That's his score, that's his actual number. So that's X. While the average round for the day was a 74. Now right here, we're not being as specific, determine whether it's the population or the sample. So we're gonna call it the mu is 74. And then the standard deviation was three stroke. Later that week, he played in a pro game where he got a 65, but the average for that one was 79 and the standard deviation is four strokes, which was Don's better round of golf in comparison to the competition. And you see how I always write the formula regardless of whether I know it or not. So let's see what he does in both of these, 3.67. And this one was negative 3.5 on the dot, but you need to add a what? Zero because Z scores are what? Z scores are two decimal places. And you see what I'm gonna do here, Z equals negative 3.50. Why do I keep writing that? Because on your work, I'm not gonna be looking around on your work to find out what Z is. And you say, oh, I wrote it straight across. When you write it specifically, for me to be able to see, you see it does not take all this time. When you write it specifically, there is no, and maybe I'll put local here and pro am here, just to make sure. So this is the work for them. And this is the work I want to see. Don't say, well, you should have obviously known that this was equal to that. You guys be writing too sloppy for me. So if that's the case, this is specific. It tells me exactly what I need to know. And here is all the work for it. You must do the work. You must plug the numbers into the formula to get any credit. No credit if I'm looking at work for numbers not plugged into the formula. Okay, the calculator is doing the numbers for you. So with that being the case, which was Don's better 
round of golf in comparison to the competition. Remember, in golf, the lower score is the better. So he did better on the charity, which was the local one. Lots of examples, lots of work, but hopefully you understand. I'm pretty sure. I know you can look up on YouTube and find some videos, all right, that show you how to do this quickly, but I'm sure that there are none that are as thorough as what we just went to because I am P.S., you know. So anyway, that's enough of this. This was a long video and don't forget to do what? So make sure you comment, like, subscribe, and share to some of your friends. Tell them about P.S. I'm at 220. I'm trying to get to 240. We're moving on up. So like, comment, and subscribe. This is Professor Sam.